Greetings, everyone. Welcome to our weekly Bible study. Trust you're having a blessed day. Uh, as we are nearing the end of our journey through the Minor Prophets, we're coming to the next to the last one. And we're going to look at Zechariah today. We've looked at all of these prophets. Some of them were prophets to, to nations outside of Judah. That's the southern kingdom or Israel, the northern kingdom, like Nineveh. A couple went to Nineveh. Um, went, went to eat them. Um, but we're we're getting to the point where we're wrapping up. The ex, the Jews have returned from exile. And so last couple of weeks, we looked at Haggai, um, who talked about our priorities, about finishing the task. And Zechariah is kind of a continuation with a twist, with a different perspective of looking at that theme of finishing the task, because he's going to be talking also about the coming of God's kingdom. So let's get right into it. Who is Zechariah? Zechariah was both a priest and a prophet who, along with Haggai, had returned to out of exile with the 50,000 that had been led by Zerubbabel. And so they began the rebuilding of the Jewish temple, but it had stalled. They had stopped for about 16 to 17 years, and God had sent these two prophets who were already there. They were living in the area, but God raised them up and said to Haggai, Zechariah, you need to speak to the people. They both began prophesying in 520 BC. Um, Haggai only prophesies for about four months. Four very clear, simple messages. Zechariah is going to prophesy over a number of years. And while his message was similar to Haggai's, which was, rebuild my place of worship, rebuild the house of the Lord, the temple, it's written in a very, very different style. More like how Daniel wrote, and in the New Testament, like Revelation. Uh, lots of symbolism, lots of visions, and you, you have a vision of four horsemen, or you have the vision of four horns and four craftsmen, or the vision of a man with the measuring line, or like we would call like a tape measure, going out and measuring, and or the vision of a scroll. And of course, all of them had symbolic meaning in the life uh, of the, the household of Israel. In fact, 31 quotations or 31 verses from Zechariah are found in the book of Revelation. So John, when he writes his Revelation, is very much familiar with the Old Testament. He was familiar with Daniel's prophecy and, and relies heavily on Daniel, but he's also referring to Zechariah. Now, why the primary message was to motivate the people to finish the task, which was the same as Haggai, he includes some extra. It's a longer book. Uh, it's eight chapters in length. Uh, actually, I think it's 12 chapters now to think about it. And where Haggai is, is you know, several chapters at length. So he has some extra material. And I just wanted to highlight before we get into kind of the, the core of his message, some of the things he said about the coming Messiah. He talks about the coming servant, the one that's going to come and serve God's people. The Jewish people recognize that. As they looked back and read the scroll that included um, Zechariah, that that message that referring to the coming servant was referring to the Messiah. Now, that's interesting because the Messiah was not seen as a servant. He was seen as a conquering king. But the reality is, is that even in the Old Testament, there were those that whether it was just God speaking through them, not the, the prophet not fully aware, or, or, or just it was a thought that never caught on, but the fact that Messiah was going to be a servant. He was going to serve his people. Now, if you want to read the New Testament counterpart, read the Gospel of Mark, because Mark's theme is Jesus, the suffering servant. And he picks up on this. We also see about the branch that comes out of the stump, the stump referring to the nation that basically looked dead, and yet there was going to be life that came from it. 
And yet the New Testament writers and others saw the branch as having a messianic aspect to it. One more clearly we see is the lonely key, the lowly king coming and riding into the city on a donkey, um, which, of course, is what Jesus did on Palm Sunday. Um, we see this the selling of the 30 pieces of silver that was thrown to the potter. Okay, that was taking place there. Of course, we know that Jesus was was basically sold for 30 pieces of silver. We see about the hands of this messianic person being pierced. Okay. Uh, again, Psalms talks a little bit about that, Psalm uh, chapter 2. And then we see this very futuristic, something that has not happened yet, but also referring to the Messiah, about his arriving, and when he comes... He will stand on the Mount of Olives and it will split and it, there will be a valley that will come. It's interesting. I was listening years ago to a preacher that was preaching uh, from this passage and he made this comment. And I, I have to be honest here. I don't know if it's absolutely true, but I have no reason to doubt it. But he says within the Jewish nation, there's an understanding among geologists that there's a fault that runs underneath the Mount of Olives, okay? And so that this idea of the splitting is, yes, it would be miraculous by any stretch, but all of a sudden there seems there's some credibility that gets attached to this idea that when the Messiah comes the second time, the second coming of Jesus Christ, and he comes and he stands on the Mount of Olives, when he's looking out over Jerusalem, the mountain will split, and all of a sudden there will be a river that will uh, that will flow between the two halves of the mountain. So these are some of the things that are in Zechariah. So it's a very rich book. Um, again, because of the symbolic nature, most people don't go to Zechariah. They go to some of the easier books where it's a much clearer. Haggai is much clearer because he's writing in a narrative form whereas Zechariah is writing in with uh, symbolism throughout. Well, let's get into it. The first thing the prophet does is he calls the people to repent. He says, return, return to me. Now, you know what um, to repent means. It, it's the idea of to turn around, to change course. I'm heading in this one direction. I repent of my ways. It's, but repentance is not just feeling sorry and feeling sad for what I've done, but it's changing course. It's changing course. The, the, the word in the Greek is metanoa, okay, which means to change course. It's the idea he's using here, return to me, change course, return to me, and I will return to you. Return what? Instead of a, a, a path and a destiny of wrath, discipline, God says, I want a path because my heart is to bless you. That's what God's heart is. So when he disciplines his children, it's not because he's mean. It's because he wants to get their attention and says, I want to be in that loving, agape relationship with you. So change always begins with the change of mind slash heart. He then goes into a series of visions. Most of the book, he's looking at visions. And these visions are to encourage the people. Remember, context. He's writing at the same time that Haggai is writing to get the people to get back and finish the task. So he's trying to share with them through these visions that he's presenting, ideas that will encourage them and motivate them to finish the task. So let's look at the first one. The first vision declares that though our enemies are evil, Though our enemies are evil, that God is aware of our situation. Okay, God is aware of our situation. And because he's aware of our situation, what is his response? And this is important. He says, I will deal compassionately with my people. I have not forgotten my covenant. Those I love will not be abandoned. Might be disciplined, but they won't be abandoned. I have plans to restore and honor my people. So the first encouraged message from Zechariah to the people is, 
the enemies are going to be dealt with. The ones that have harmed you and hurt you. And I, as a compassionate God, haven't forgotten you. The next vision goes on to declare that God's judgment will fall upon the unjust or evildoers who have brought destruction on the people. He uses the imagery of horns and craftsmen here. Now, we don't have time to go into it deep. It's a very fascinating thought. Horns is another word for kingdoms. And if you're, if you're not sure what I mean by that, go back and read Daniel where he talks about horns. Uh, or even in Revelation where they talk about horns. Typically, when horns are used in the Bible, it's referring to kingdoms. Sometimes it refers to the leader, although I think that's what the crafts man is referring to but the reality is is that what he's saying in this second vision is there are kingdoms and i will deal with them they are going to fall these people that have harmed my people who have come against my people and you can see that encourages the people that they're not forgotten that god is going to right the wrong and he's going to topple those kingdoms now I didn't want to get into this. I'll just mention this briefly. He says there are four horns. So the question is, what four kingdoms was he referring to? Now, if he's referring to the kingdoms that Daniel's referring to, then he's referring to Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. He's referring to Cyrus's Persia's. He's referring to Alexander the Great's Greeks. And he's referring to the Roman Empire. But most scholars don't believe he's referring to the Roman Empire but more than likely the Egyptian empire, because this would have been the context. They would have understood how the Egyptians had been harmful to the people. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'll leave it to you to decide which of the four kingdoms. It's, so it's, I think most people, there's consensus that it's Babylon that had been, brought them into captivity. The Persians, who even at the point, point that Zechariah is writing, uh, is in control. And there's idea about this upstart kingdom out west that we need later known as Alexander the Great and, and the Greek kingdom. But what's the message? What, However you interpret that is that God is on the throne. That's what Daniel said. There's a kingdom mightier than all the kingdoms of the earth that will be brought down. Zechariah doesn't use that imagery. He just talks about the fact that these kingdoms, these horns, will be toppled. God will take care of those who have done injustice to my people. And then he declares that there will be a day when it will be impossible to measure the size of the city. Now you say, so what's the big deal about that? At this point, when Zechariah is prophesying, there are probably only thousands of people. This is not a major city. Okay. In fact, when the 50,000 came, they were larger than what most historians believe was the population that was living in the area. Okay. And so we're talking about maybe at the most tens of thousands of people. And yet, when Zechariah is sharing this message, he envisions a day when the city will be so vast that you're wasting your time, time trying to measure the size of it. And yet, there are no walls. And at this time, when Zechariah is talking, there is no walls. It's not going to happen until decades later when Nehemiah comes and builds the wall. So what's the word of encouragement here? That God will be a wall of fire around the people. Now, when I first read this many years ago when I was pastoring, I read this and said, God will be a wall of fire. And I started thinking about how fire is used because fire represents the presence of God. They okay, remember when Israel was moving from uh, Egypt um, through the wilderness, they were led by a pillar of fire, and that when God's presence would show up uh, in the whole, most holy place, it would show as a fire from heaven. And Isaiah, or excuse me, Ezekiel talks about the fire that comes indicating the presence of the Lord. So within the literature of the Jews, and to our understanding today, fire, the role of fire, indicates the presence of God. So when God says, I'm going to be a wall of fire about you. Okay. I think there's a there's a richness to it because what did fire do? Well, obviously, the media context protect because that's what walls do. 
they protect. So God's going to protect his people. But we also see, and we're going to see this next week with Malachi, that fire was used to refine or to purify. Okay, how do you take that ore and you get it so that it's in more of its pure form? You put it under intense heat. You, play, you apply fire to it. And all of a sudden, it removes the dross or the impurities out of the ore so that you have the purity. So God is in the process. And of course, Malachi is going to spend quite a bit of time talking about that God wanted to refine his people. He wanted to purify them. Okay, They had made some good decisions, but they had a long way to go. And God wanted to say, I'm going to help you in your maturity and spiritual maturity that's taking place. But it's also a way of testing, of testing. You know, there's an old song we used to sing, some through the water, some through the flood, okay? Some through great sorrow, but all through the blood. And the idea there is that that's also what the fire does. It, it tests the integrity. Now, where do we pick up that theme? You go to Peter. Peter talks about this, that he will test our faith to see what it's made of and to, to see how pure it is. So there's a combination of refining, but also testing that takes place. Well, let's face it, folks. You and I find out what we're, the grit we're made out of, not when things are going well, but when we're facing some difficult times. We face those challenges and all of a sudden we find out, you know, what's, what's the level of integrity or is it kind of a wink and nod and we kind of skirt the issue. So when God says, I will be a wall of fire about you, I think there's a richness the prophet is giving to us. But more than that, Zechariah says, in God's presence, not only will it be a wall of fire, but he is going to reside in the middle of the fire. Now, I don't know if this is what Zechariah meant, so I might be stepping out a little bit, but just Think with me for a moment. Is God trying to say that if we really want to enjoy the presence of God, that we've got to walk through this wall of fire to get into the middle? And I thought about that. Because it's through the crucible of those difficulties, crucible of suffering. I mean, James picks up on that. And we'll, we're going to look at that in a few weeks when we start a study in the book of James. This idea that there's something positive in our life when we're faced with these difficult challenges that take place. Well, let's move on. So he's going to be a wall of fire, not just to come and meet them at the temple, but the entire city. And this is the beauty of this word from Zechariah will become the dwelling place of God. So it's not just one location is I can encounter God just about anywhere. I mean, isn't that what Moses learned? <laughs> Moses wasn't in a temple when he met God. He was out in the middle of the desert and says, this is the holy place. It's a saint. It's holy because God was there. And God met Moses. So God's protection is better than any walls is the message to the people. That God is going to be their protector. And he ends that little vision, too, with this promise. Behold, I am coming, and I will dwell in your midst. Many nations are going to join in in that day and will become my people. Wow. There is, there's a whole sermon right there in that verse. Behold, I'm coming. More than likely, he's referring to the second coming year, but it definitely could apply to the first coming as well, because obviously the first coming hasn't taken place yet. It's, it's still in the future. But the reality is, is that God is saying, I'm going to come. I'm going to meet with you. I'm going to dwell in your midst. And by the way, it's not just going to be for you. It's going to be for the nations of the world. Now, that was always God's heart, even going back to Abraham. But the Jews kind of got a little, little, you know, centric there in terms of thinking about the nation itself and not realizing that they were to be a light to the Gentiles, a light to the world. And that they will come when all people, all nations that turn to him will become my people. 
again, I'm not so sure the people in his day really got, got a hold of that. But we see here in Zechariah a powerful message that Paul is going to pick up on when he talks about the Gentiles being grafted in and becoming God's people. They are spiritual Jews is maybe a way of saying it. Well, let's move on. The next vision, and it's kind of cut off on our screen here, but the vision is the idea of a priest who's in rags, filthy rags, and he's given a robe of righteousness. Okay. And actually the priest in his vision is Joshua, who was the high priest. Now, what is that message? The message is, is that you and I come to God filled with sin, junk, whatever you want to call it. But if we turn to him and, re and repent of our ways and recognize his sovereignty and his leadership in our life, he will, as we say, place upon us a robe of righteousness. Now, the question is, does that mean now we're always going to do right things? Whose righteousness do we wear today? Not my own. Last time I checked, I probably don't have to go 24 hours before I can come up with a few things I messed up on. Okay. But yet, what does God say about a Christ follower? That we are clean, we are forgiven, we are righteous. Whose righteousness then are we wearing if we're not wearing our own righteousness? Well, we know from the New Testament, it's the righteous, righteousness of Jesus Christ. In other words, when I say yes to Jesus, and I say, I want you to be the Lord of my life, forgive me of my self-centeredness, my sinfulness, I turn to you, I ask for forgiveness, I realize that you paid a heavy penalty for my sin on a cross, all of a sudden, the righteousness of Christ comes upon me. Again, doesn't perfect me. That's not what it's trying to say at all. It just means that I've gone before the judge. The judge has looked at Dwayne, and when he, all he saw was Dwayne, he just shook his head. But all of a sudden, when Jesus stepped in the picture, all of a sudden, he says, not guilty. Boy, isn't that a glorious thought? Not guilty. Well, let's move on. Another vision. He declares that he will give us his spirit. He talks about oil there to finish the task. Now, the task looks like a physical issue. But how many times are we aware of the fact that even though we've got conflict going on sometimes or we have other things going on, that there's a spiritual dimension that's taking place? I remember as a pastor once in a while just seeing people in the church being people, right? Which means sometimes they didn't get along with each other. And it just seemed like Every time you thought you put out one fire, there would be another one that crop up. And finally, my prayer time, I would just say, God, I'm sick and tired of the enemy creating havoc here. Because what it was like, it was like people were just succumbing to those little thoughts in their head. You know what? When, um, when Jean said that, you know, she really had a bad agenda. Where did that thought come from? That's a spiritual issue. That's a spiritual issue that's taking place. And so what God is saying to them is we need God's presence. We need his oil in our life. Again, oil can also represent the spirit of God in order for us to finish the task or to get the victory. Now, we know that this task will be completed. And then he goes into chapter four and tells us why. First of all, it's not going to be might or it's not going to be power. Now, what did Zechariah mean there? Because this nation was not going to rival anybody. It wasn't a military might. Um, it wasn't strong like it was in the time of David and Solomon, which speaks to the fact that when you and I are dealing with life, it's it's not our abilities. It's not our personalities that anything or done for God is going to actually make, make any sense and survive and last. But what is it? It's by my spirit. Zacharias says, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, things are going to happen. And this is where Zachariah is picking up on what Haggai talked about, that it's not the grandeur of the building. It's not the beauty of the building. But what is it? It's the presence. It's not by my work, but it's by the spirit of God. It's the presence of God that matters the most. So then he goes on to say, so therefore, don't despise these meager beginnings, you know, this, this temple that's made with discarded materials and, you know, burnt rocks and, 
you know, charred lumber and all these other things. Don't despise these small beginnings. And that's a tough message today because we're in a world where success is measured by size. How big our 401k is, how big our armies are, how big the economy is. We can go on. How many, how many championships? We got the Kansas City Chiefs. They got two in a row and they're going to go for a three-peat next year. You know, and yet I was reading something about the Chiefs. This was probably one of their weakest teams. And the person who was writing this was making the statement, says they've had talent galore much better than they've had this year. But what they had this year that they probably didn't have before is they were all on the same page. Okay? When they come together and when they get unified, they were dropping passes left and right. They couldn't, you know, every time they turned around, Somebody was off sides or someone was moving too soon or someone lined up. I mean, it was like, they look, I got high school teams that look better than they did sometimes, and, you know, because they were making mistakes all over the place. And, and, and so we get big. We want, you know, what's the phrase now? Big, get, uh, be big or go home. What? What's God's standard? What's God's standard? Well, first of all, it's the presence of the Spirit. Can it be said of you and me, these people have been with Jesus? Some, they weren't totally uneducated people, but by the, the echelon and the upper crust of Jerusalem, they, they were ignorant individuals out of Galilee. And yet they said, after listening to them, something, these, these people have been with Jesus. Would you love that to be said about you and me? Dwayne, he's, he's pet with Jesus. Now, I'm not so sure what that looks like. Maybe what comes out of my mouth, what I say, what probably all of the above, right? Okay, because I, when we've been with Jesus, it impacts our thoughts, our conversation, our language, and our actions. Is our life enriching others, or is it all about us? Have we spent time at the master's feet? Or are we people of might and power? What Zechariah would say to us, we need a fresh flow of God's spirit. And we need to begin to apply God's word to empower us for his service. See, the lampstand, as he talks about oil and lampstand, the lampstand is a piece of furniture that can be very decorative and everything else. But you need the oil in order to have any practical value. You and I can have all the talents in the world. You and I can just have gone and gotten all the training and expertise and everything else. But sometimes it needs the presence of God to show up. I, I have, I'm meeting with my students now. I've set up about 45 minutes and they sign up for time to meet with me. And I, every time I go, I have no idea what issues we're going to talk about because it can be about anything. I give them freedom. And I say, God, give me wisdom. Give me wisdom. I thank you for all the experience, but there's sometimes experience is just not enough. You need the wisdom of God. You need the presence of God. And I, I had a couple come in this morning and they, I had met with them before and they're thinking about getting married. They asked me to marry, to do the premarital. And I told them no. And I saw them down, downcast and everything else. But as we were talking, I, the, the Lord just gave me some things to share. And I go, where'd that come from? Mm -hmm. And that was not something that kind of, it was and all of a sudden I saw them peace enter that room that we were talking. That was a God moment. That was a God moment. We, you and I need more of his presence, more of his Holy Spirit. Secondly, we need to persevere. They had started the projects earlier, started the project earlier, but stopped. We need people who will stay with it and not get discouraged by small beginnings. Because it's God's presence that makes the difference. Um, I pastored a kind of a startup church, and you get it, you attract a certain type of person in the startup. But once it gets to a certain point, um, and I don't know the reasons, uh, you could you know come up with some where maybe they they they're now not the big fish in a small pond, and now they're a small fish, and you know they want to go find another small pond that they can go be a big fish and you, you don't know and you want you don't want to second guess them but the reality is is that many of the people that start out with you when you're 25 30 40 are not with you when you're 150 200 250 
Okay, just interesting dynamically. And partly it's because for sure, a lot of people that show up when you're 250, there's no way they would ever come to the church when it's 25. Because when you see something small, that looks like hard work. And you know, if you've done this once, no one in their right mind usually wants to do it a second time. Okay, to go through that whole experience of trying to get a church established in a community. Small beginnings are tough because you're not quite sure if it's ever going to pan out the way you think it could pan out. Okay, it's like that little kid that was two years old. All of you had dreams for that little two year old Johnny and Janie and whatever. But there was no certainty of how that was going to pan out. So those small beginnings are tough. And so we need to persevere through those moments. And that's the message that Zachariah is giving the people. This is a tough moment, but persevere. Good days are coming. Then he gives them a vision about them violating his commandments. He actually lists two of the Ten Commandments there. And he basically says that I'm going to deal with it because Part of my relationship with Israel at that point was that they understood the law and how it applied in their life. And so he's using the Ten Commandments as an illustration of that. And that judgment would come to those who did not take seriously the commandments of God. And then the prophet challenges the people to focus less on religious activity. For example, they're talking about, well, should we continue to fast? Should we fast on the first and third day should we fast on the second fifth day they, they were having all these and god comes back and says all right fasting is important but you're missing the point because here's what he says what i want you to do is i want you to administer true justice i want you to show mercy i want you to show compassion to one another do not oppress the widow or the fatherless the alien or the poor by the way the word alien there is the same uh, that we use when we talk about illegal aliens today. It actually means the same thing. In the poor, in your hearts, do not think evil of each other because you ignored me before you were scattered. But I am jealous for you. Return to me. So what is he saying there? You know, there if you ever attended church, and we, and we still have church here in, in many of our facilities and everything else and there are certain religious activities we have a time of prayer we have a time of singing and all of them have value but if that's what you see as what walking with god is all about then you have missed the big picture and that's what zachariah said he was saying there he says you know what all of that may, may have value that fasting okay great but you know what if you fast but you don't practice justice, justice, or you don't show mercy, or you don't show compassion, who cares? Now, that's how Dwayne would say it. That's not how Zachariah would say it. But the reality is, is that's the point here. Now, unless you think I'm off in the deep end, and you might think that, and that's all right, it reminds me of a passage in the book of James, where he says to the people, what is pure religion? And he doesn't go into doctrine, even though doctrine is important. He doesn't go into religious activity. He says, take care of the orphans and the widows. You want to practice pure religion? In other words, and of course we know what the book of James is, put your faith into action. Okay? It's good that you do all these things, but if it doesn't lead to something that makes a difference in your world, pretty worthless, pretty worthless. So the book ends with a look to the future of a coming conqueror. God's supernatural care. And this is where we get the song showers of blessings shower. So he talks about the showers that God was going to rain, which was the lifeblood of the economy and that God would bring back his people and they will remember never to forget, never to forget. That was the word of encouragement. Now there's more to the book, but I think sometimes if we can just focus on a few things, maybe we'll, we'll take away more. And so what was his message? Finish the task. I'll take care of your enemies, the ones that have used and abused you through the years. But you need to make sure that you are 
walking with me, staying true to the law, practicing justice, mercy, compassion, because I'm still on the throne. I will help you if you'll just turn to me. Turn to me. That's the message I think God has for many that probably attend church. It's a reminder that sometimes we get so distracted that we need to return. Go back to your first love and enjoy the one who grants forgiveness and righteousness and cleansing in our lives. Father, we thank you for your word today. And ask, Lord, that wherever we are in our season of walking with you, that we'll know that, one, you have a heart for us, a heart of compassion. And, Lord, may we then take that in our relationship with you and then be your hands and your feet, showing mercy, showing compassion, showing justice in a world that desperately, desperately needs to hear that message and that we may finish well. See, they were building a temple. We're coming to the end of our life's journey. May we end this life journey well as we focus on the things that matter most to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all. Have a great, great day. We'll see you next week as we look at Malachi. Blessings.